we have arrived at act three of our program. Act three, how do you slow this thing down? This next story is a follow-up to a story we ran a couple years ago. It was a full episode of our show about one of our contributors, Joshua Behrman, and his family. And the background is Josh's parents got divorced when he was little. He and his brother Ethan grew up with their dad. Their dad is a physicist in suburban Los Angeles. Josh's mom and his half-brother David, they lived very differently. They kind of drifted around, ended up in Florida, barely keeping it together. Josh's mom was an alcoholic. David was an aspiring rapper getting acquainted with the court system. And together they lived in this tiny condo in a retirement community in West Palm Beach called Century Village, where they did not belong, nobody was retired. And they would get into various kinds of jams and crises and then Josh would fly to Florida to try to help. He ended up spending a lot of time there. And what you're about to hear now is an experiment at creating a radio drama with the structure of one of our regular documentary stories on our show. The real Josh Behrman is gonna narrate and then instead of going to quotes on tape, like we usually do, we have actors performing scenes that really happened. And in those scenes, Josh is played by Josh Hamilton, his brother David is played by James Ransom. And the story begins last year when the real Josh found himself back in Florida with his two brothers. My mother's been in the hospital so much by now, she's figured out how to direct the paramedics, like emergency chauffeurs or something, to all the best facilities. Her room at Wellington Regional is big and bright. It's a corner room with big windows and a nice view, although she can't see it because right now she's connected to state-of-the-art equipment behind a curtain. When I walk in, my brother David is there already. Hey, man. Oh, this whole thing it was like a fucked-up remix of The Night Before Christmas because it was the night before Christmas. Is this story gonna be in rhyme? Oh, shut up. <laughs> David, what happened? You know how she gets around the holidays. I, mean, I, I thought that you and Ethan were gonna bring her out to California. Oh, man, I don't know why we didn't. I think it was Ethan's schedule, or we probably just didn't try hard enough. Nah, nah, you never know when she's gonna get all twisted like that. I wasn't even really around. Where were you? I, I was kicking it with this girl from school, Tasha. I went over to her house early on Christmas Eve because they were having turkey dinner and everything, you know, like a normal family. I had to get out of Century Village, man. I was cooped up in there with mom. She was driving me crazy. So I'm at Tasha's and mom calls and she sounds all drunk, right? And she's like, something happened to the car. Something, ha what kind of something? I don't know, that's what I said. <laughs> that sounds like something you would tell me. I know, and now I know how you feel. Whatever happened, the car got stuck and I couldn't get to her. I, I couldn't ask Tasha's family, like, hey, can you give me a lift over to Gun Club Road on Christmas Eve to pick up my mom? So how did she get home? I, I think Peggy picked her up. And by the time I got back to the condo the next day, she was, she was pretty deep in it, but it didn't seem like that big of a deal, really. And then, and then she woke up and she was short of breath, so I was like... Wait, 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 for how long? Uh, Tuesday, so for like a day. And you didn't call me sooner? Dude, she's done this shit like a million times. I mean, she wasn't even that worried about it. I, she didn't want me to ride in the ambulance with her. She was like, I'll see you later tonight, Dave. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Schneider. I, are, you, are you the older brother? Yes. You have a medical power of attorney? Yes. Good. And who's Ethan? Uh, our other brother. He's also coming from he California. He has a medical power of attorney? Yes. Not him. No. Okay. Oh, uh, did your mother go to Cornell? Yes, why? Uh, she told us. W what else did she say? That she does not consume alcohol. <laughs> Those were her last words before going under. Soon enough, though, withdrawal told a very different story. The first time this happened was five years ago, when David called and told me he had to remit himself to the local sheriff's office for, quote, just a quick jail sentence. <laughs> oh, and mom's in the hospital. So I flew to Florida that next day and went straight to the ICU. And here's what happened that time. Well, looks like she'll never be the same again. What, are, are you the neurologist? Oh, I see we have a savvy medical consumer here. No. <laughs> it's 2 a.m. I'm just the guy on rotation. 
So she scored low on the GOAT test, which measures brain function. She got a 62, probably permanently impaired. 62? Out, out of what? Uh, out of 100. Although, no one ever really scores 100. Oh, that's true. I took it myself for practice in nursing school. I got like an 80. Yeah, for a perfect score, you'd have to be like Superman or something. No, no, no. You know who could get 100? What's that guy? You know the guy who can do anything, including karate. Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> no, no, no. He's dead. He would score poorly. <laughs> no, the, um, the speaker guy who can do anything. Jesus Christ, if I was him, I'd never forget anyone's name. Uh, he helps you realize your full potential. He's six and a half feet tall. Come on, ladies. He's uh, Tony Robbins? Yes. Exactly. That guy? That guy, he can score 100. <laughs> so as the medical professionals discussed how awakening the giant within can totally boost your neurological scores, <laughs> one of the other nurses came and told me that earlier they'd had to restrain my mom because even though she was unconscious, she'd somehow managed to get a hold of cigarettes. They caught her trying to light one in bed. We're not even sure where she got it, the nurse said. But that's when I knew that my mother would be just fine. Within days, she was sitting up, completely lucid, chatting up strangers, everyone's favorite in the wing. This time, things were bad enough that I called my brother Ethan. He can only come in a true emergency because he plays for the LA Philharmonic and he has a couple kids and his schedule's planned out months in advance. He took the red eye straight from playing after Disney Hall. Well, here we are again. <sighs> How you doing, man? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Hey, hey buddy. buddy. Good to see you. You holding up? Yeah, I'm right. right. Nice tux. <laughs> yeah. Thought my stage attire might help me look a little more official. She in there? Yeah. Right now, Ethan is working on a giant Mahler retrospective. They're going to play all nine symphonies. It's something that's never been done before. Oh, uh, Ethan, this is Dr. Snyder. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, your mother had a heart attack. Uh, she has severe respiratory distress, nearly septic infection. If we can get her breathing on her own again, recovery is possible, but would take a long time. And then what? That's a good question. No, that is a good question. And if she needs in-home care, I don't think David could do it. They can't keep the cable on. And if she doesn't make it, what then? Where is he going to live? Right? He can't stay at Century Village. I mean, it's a retirement community. With a perimeter, it's like, it's like a, a geriatric army base. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how he hasn't gotten kicked out already. They're definitely on to him. And if they realize mom isn't coming back... <laughs> I'm sure we're going to get calls any day now. Which one are you working on? Oh, the eighth. Oh, that's a, that's a, a big one. Yeah, right? it's a big one. Has some really nice passages, though. Hey, Mom, I know you can hear me. We, we love you, and we need you. What's it about? Eternal life. It's David who says that mom would be happy that all three of her boys were together. And that's true. One of the few real senses of family I can recall is summers in the Midwest with her when we were all children years ago. And we made ice cream and caught fireflies and roller skated, normal things like that. That's why David doesn't like being in the room much now. Because he doesn't want to remember mom like this, trapped in so many tubes. It's like some jacked up Darth Vader shit, he says. And yet, he's the one who's been in her bedside the most. I can't bring myself to kiss her the way David does. I don't know why. After Ethan goes back to California, I stay with David and Mom. Time is merciless in Florida, and especially merciless in the ICU. Days turn into weeks, and every afternoon, I pick up David, and we go to the hospital, 
talk to some doctors, wait, talk to some more doctors, and then maybe get dinner. Very little changes. Yo, 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 yo I still want to show you that video that I was telling you about. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, all right, hold, hold up, hold up. In this very strange video, David's friend Sebastian, a completely grown man, is standing on some Florida crabgrass, breakdancing, robot style, and the music is a tinny Casio sounding version of Furelise. You know, he's pretty good. I know. But why is this happening? I, I don't know. We were just hanging out there on the driveway like a bunch of us. Dude just starts doing a robot. <laughs> he does that sometimes, right? And this one time, he was doing it in my face for a really long time. For like a half hour. <laughs> no, no, I couldn't even believe it, man. <laughs> that he could keep it up that long? No, I'm more that I had to watch it for so long. Because <laughs> no, I was like, I was like kind of trapped there, right? And at first... I was trying not to look, and then I couldn't look away. <laughs> Let me see that again. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. It was like I was in denial at first, and then I accepted it. <laughs> like the stages of grief. Exactly, exactly. And then I reached some kind of state of bliss where it was so awesome that I was almost in tears. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it's exactly the Kubler-Ross model. But. Well, they should add that one, the awesome state. It's nice spending time with David, but I'm also really worried about him. He's had a history with pills on and off over the years, and I suspect it's on again. One night while we're driving to dinner, David says, oh, hey, Josh, can we stop over at the Victory? That's a gas station down on Okeechobee Boulevard, and Victory is a total misnomer for the kind of place where you pull in and just see a bunch of weird dudes crouching around the entrance, like it's a totally normal social spot. And David knows everyone here, which is weird, um, and I'm pretty sure something illicit is happening, but I don't want to ask because I don't want to be the man with David. And he probably wouldn't tell me anyhow. Ah, it's nothing, David says. Sure, just your regular nighttime rendezvous in the parking lot of an off-brand gas station. David gets back in the car and he says, all right, I'm good, but I'm not so sure. It's weird, but Mom and David are a team. They've been like a fucked up crazy team for a long time but a team nonetheless, and they've taken care of each other. And the question on my mind is, if mom doesn't make it, whether David will. All right, guys, she might destabilize immediately, but if she makes it, we'll, uh, we'll load her up and get her over to the hospice facility right away. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little concerned that, that she can hear you. I mean, I think oh. that she understands you. Yeah, I know, this is hard for you, an adjustment to end of life care. Yeah, I mean, so. she's right there. Right, do you have any other questions? Uh, well, I yeah, was... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about Xanax. Uh, well, she's already getting out of Ann, which is uh, also for anxiety. It's uh, part of I the meant for me. No, 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 check it out. I'm not talking like a whole prescription or anything. I was just wondering if you could hook me up with like a couple, you know, just for right now. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't accommodate that request. I'm gonna go outside and smoke. This shit is getting a little too real for me right now. Well, the hospice is nice. Institutional, but warm. Like, people are allowed to bring pets and stuff. One lady even brought her horse, the intake guy was very excited to tell us. I spend some time going through mom's things. I find her address book, which is a mess. Stuffed with post-its and scraps, bearing faded numbers in mom's perfect cursive. How, I, I, how can we call her friends? I don't know who's who. I, I mean, no one visited her in the hospital. <sighs> we should have called people sooner. She doesn't really have that many friends around anymore. And I'm telling you, she didn't want visitors at the hospital. Well, yes, but they might want to see her. Well, I don't have her friends' numbers. David, because I need you to help me figure this out. I got to take care of some shit right now. Where are, you, where are you going? Dude, you've been wandering in and out of here for weeks. Is it pills or what? No, nah, no. Nah, it's, it's Sebastian, right? He's got this other friend who called him. And, and so? Th th that can wait. What is with all the weird, petty dramas? Half the time you're pacing around on your phone, dealing with some crisis like Jimmy Carter at Camp David. Well, I got Peggy's number. Why didn't you tell me that before? You didn't ask. Dude! This is when you call people. When your mother is dying, you call her fucking friends. Yo, 
she can hear you. And I know that you wouldn't be all mad at me right now because you're mad at yourself or something, but this whole situation is fucked up. I accepted it a long time ago. Yeah, I accept that it's fucked up. I've been here for six weeks. And I appreciate everything that you have done, but I've been here the whole time. When mom fell and knocked herself out, or when I found her in the backyard, or when I took her to get the last of her teeth removed, I wish it was different. But it is what it is. Mom is my best friend. And you, you're gonna get to go home. And I'm gonna be the one who's stranded here. Now I have to go. Sebastian locked himself in his garage somehow. <laughs> and you should call Peggy. But do that shit outside. I finally bring myself to start holding mom's hand. And she rubs my palm. I think David's right, she knows. Each time, her grip gets a little stronger. I look in her terrified eyes and see my own. One night, just before I leave for the day, she takes my hand with both of hers. It's the biggest show of purpose in weeks. And for a second, I don't see the tubes, the room, the cracked lips, or her papery fingers. No one else is here, it's just us. The next morning, there was a message on my phone from the hospice before I got up. I know, they always say it was peaceful. And they'd made arrangements with the King David Cemetery for the next day. Man, my stomach hurts. I can't tell if it's his funeral stuff or from that bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit I ate this morning. Hmm. I mean, I'm gonna guess it's the former. I don't know, that shit was pretty gross. You wanna hear something funny? So, I was at home earlier today, right? Watching TV, just, just trying to take my mind off of things, you know? And then all of a sudden, TV goes black, and I'm like, oh shit, this is all I need right now. So I find this cable bill from before mom went in the hospital, it was like 15 bucks, but she forgot to pay it, as usual, and the whole thing was like such a mom type scenario, you know? I mean, it's just exactly the type of thing that she would have done. So when the TV went black, I <laughs> kind of thought it was like mom saying a little hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay. I hope so. All right, let's get rolling. The sun is low on the horizon, beneath the clouds, bringing up steam from the grass. If you include the funeral director and the two Haitian dudes lounging on tombstones waiting to fill in the grave, there are only nine people listening. The scene feels like a frontier funeral, a clutch of poor souls standing around a pine box, like we should leave here in a covered wagon and keep heading west, and just be glad the devil's drink didn't bury us too. Joshua Berriman in the scenes, Josh Hamilton played him, James Ransone played his brother David, Matt Marks was Ethan and played the French horn, our doctors were Bavesh Patel and Seth Barish who also played the rabbi, nurses were Carolyn Baumler and Zakia Young, Terry Kinney directed the story on the stage. <laughs> 